Good morning, my name is Jay Edgar. Please stand for the reading of God's Word. We don't have it on the overhead this morning, so if you'd like to follow along, it's on page 734. It's Matthew 3, verses 1 through 17. In those days, John the Baptist came to the Judean wilderness and began preaching. His message was, repent your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The prophet Isaiah was speaking about John when he said, He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. John's clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. For food, he ate locusts and wild honey. People from Jerusalem and from all of Judea and all over the Jordan Valley went out to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees Sadducees coming to watch him baptize, he denounced them. You brood of snakes, he exclaimed, who warned you to flee God's coming wrath? Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Don't just say to each other, we're safe, for we are descendants of Abraham. That means nothing, for I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. Even now, the axe of God's judgment is poised, ready to sever the roots of the trees. Yes, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. I baptize with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not worthy even to be his slave or carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He is ready to separate the chaff from the wheat with his winnowing fork. Then he will clean up the threshing area, gathering the wheat into his barn, but burning the chaff with never-ending fire. Then Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. But John tried to talk him out of it. I am the one who needs to be baptized by you, he said. So why are you coming to me? But Jesus said, It should be done, for we must carry out all that God requires. So John agreed to baptize him. After his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my dearly loved Son, who brings me great joy. So in the reading of God's word, please be seated. Well, good morning, everybody. And uh, I just want to add to the chorus, we want to say happy Mother's Day to all the moms who are with us today. Uh, I was um, kind of looking around uh, for a card for my wife for Mother's Day, and uh, I ran across this one. I got a kick out of it. See what you think. Uh, At the top, it said questions for mom, okay? And uh, these are some of the questions. I'm hungry. Have we got anything to eat? Have you seen my shoes? Can you give me a ride to soccer practice? What's for dinner tonight? Can I have seconds? Have my jeans been washed? What time does the movie start? My homework's done. Can I watch TV? Would you wake me up at 6.30 in the morning? And then at the bottom it said, questions for dad. Just one. Where's mom? <laughs> That's kind of the way it is at our household, too. Well, we're continuing our We Are 12 Grappling with the Great Commission series, and that's what we've been doing. We've been kind of wrestling with what the Great Commission that Jesus gave is all about. Jesus gave this, uh, we might say marching orders, but I want to call it mission orders to his very small church of 11 disciples on the day of his resurrection in Galilee. But we know that the church did not stay small because Jesus had bigger plans, right? And because the disciples took him seriously in what he had to say. As a matter of fact, we read, you know, that it was pretty soon, like, for instance, the day of Pentecost, 
when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples, the believers in Jesus who were gathered in Jerusalem, and uh, the church just sort of exploded in growth. 3,000 people in one day, and there were a few more days that were like that in the uh, earliest times of the church. The uh, Great Commission is uh, those verses in Matthew 28, uh, 18 through 20, and uh, it goes like this. I have been given authority in heaven and earth. As you are going, we've said that's the best way to translate it, make disciples of all nations. Now, that's what we looked at last week. What does it mean to make disciples of all nations? And then we read this, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's that last part, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit that we want to look at today. Now, I think you know, baptism has been a controversial subject in the history of the church. It didn't start out that way, but it got that way in a hurry. <coughs> Excuse me. Christians have argued over what the meaning of baptism is. Is it a symbol or is it Salvation. Protestants and Catholics have argued about that issue. And then there's this one. Can babies be baptized or is there a certain age you have to reach, like 12 or 14 or 25, before you can be baptized? Lutherans and Baptists have argued about that. And do you have to be immersed or is sprinkling enough? Presbyterians and Baptists have argued about that. And uh, when being baptized by immersion, should the person be leaned forward or backwards? Okay? Baptists have argued with each other about that. All right? Kind of get the picture of Baptists here. You know they have an, uh, a reputation for arguing, uh, which might be why uh, virtually every uh, Baptist church I know of is trying to figure out a way to get the word Baptist out of their title. Okay? Isn't that right? Uh, don't worry if you're a Baptist by background. We're just having a little fun here, okay? Um, as a matter of fact, uh, I have heard covenanters described as Baptists who dance, okay? Now, if you saw me dance, you probably wouldn't say that, but nonetheless, I have heard it said that way. We like the Baptists, and we agree with them on lots of things. Okay, um, so... Then there's one more issue, which is raised by Dr. Mary Hendrickson in her material, all right? Should baptism only be carried out by a pastor, or can a layperson baptize someone else? Now, before we go on, I'm going to see a show of hands on this one, okay? Uh, if you think that only a pastor should baptize a person, raise your hand. If that's what you think. Okay, we got a few hands on that. If you think another layperson can baptize someone, raise your hand on that, all right? Yeah, you got to make a choice on this, okay? It's one or the other. All right, we got the majority of hands there. And I would just say there is nothing in the Scripture that says somebody has to be a pastor, clergy, to baptize other people. It just works out that as time went on in the church, the church got more highly organized and more of these sort of official functions gravitated towards the clergy towards those who were set aside to do the Lord's work and set aside so they could do that, you know, full-time uh, and not have other responsibilities in life. Okay, the issues surrounding baptism are complex. I think it's fair to say that. And a lot of them come down to how you interpret certain passages that talk about baptism and honestly how you fill in the blanks in terms of the questions and issues that the Scripture doesn't directly address about baptism. I know that I am not going to answer all of the questions you've had about baptism today. As a matter of fact, I'm not even going to try to answer most of them, okay? But we do have to ask this question, all right? Why was baptism so important, so crucial, so central that Jesus included it in the baseline mission he gave his disciples. In other words, why is it so important? Isn't it just a ritual? 
I mean, can't we kind of take it or leave it? We do say it's faith, not baptism, it's faith that saves. And, you know, that's all based on grace. And, I mean, can't we just be like the Quakers, you know, who just say, uh, we're just not real sure about that whole thing with baptism. We're not going to do that and just get along without it. Well, I want to answer the question about baptism's importance in three ways, okay? In Scripture, baptism is tied to heart change, the heart change that Jesus brings, and it is tied to life in the church, okay? So I want us to see uh, how that feeds into these questions about baptism. Here's the first focus. At its core, baptism declares our repentance. Okay, now whatever age you might have experienced baptism, baptism declares a life of repentance. And this goes all the way back to the guy we call John the Baptist. Remember him, that kind of wild and woolly dude who came out of the Judean wilderness preaching repentance, repent, repent, calling on otherwise normal Jews, everyday Jews, most of them rural and small town Jews, to be baptized as a sign of their repentance. So what does repentance mean? Anybody remember? What does repentance mean? Yeah. It means to turn around and go in the other direction. It means to make a U-turn in life. Repentance is like your life is going in a certain direction. You know, whatever you've decided is important. Maybe you want to Make enough money to be filthy rich. Maybe you want to get to be CEO of the company and you're elbowing other people out of the way as you go. Uh, Maybe it's something that's, you know, really destructive, obviously, like it's an addiction to alcohol or drugs or whatever. You come to a point in time, you say, I'm not going to do that anymore. That's a waste. That's ruining my life. And I don't believe this is what I was created for. I'm going to go another direction in life. That's repentance. Repentance is what we read about in uh, that famous parable of Jesus. You know, uh, we refer to it as the parable of the prodigal son. A lot of people say, no, 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 that's not quite the right title. It should be called the parable of the loving father because it's really about the patience and the love of God. But you know what this son did? He turned his back on his family. You know, he said, give me the money now. I don't want to wait for my inheritance, and he took it off to this far country, and he wasted it, he blew it, he got involved in all kinds of sinful behavior, and he hit rock bottom. And when he hit rock bottom, he said, I'm not going to do this stuff anymore. I'm going to go home, I'm going to apologize, I'm going to hope that maybe my father will take me on, not as a son, because I know I gave that up, but just as a servant, because I know I'd have it better if I could just go back and be a servant. And so off he went. That's repentance. Repentance is what the Apostle Paul did. Remember, he started out a persecutor of the church, and he was on his way to Damascus. He was going to round up these Christians. He was going to bring them back to Jerusalem for trial because some of them fled there, and he's on the Damascus road, and what happens? Jesus confronts him, and I mean knocks him down to the ground and says, Saul, Saul, that's what they called him then, Saul, Saul, why Are you persecuting me? And it started this big turnaround in life. And you know what happened? Paul became one of the leading apostles, one of the leading preachers of the good news of Jesus throughout the Gentile world. That's repentance. Repentance and a repentant lifestyle is central to what baptism is all about. John the Baptist's message was this. God's kingdom is coming into the world. God's going to be looking at people's lives and making an evaluation. And those whose hearts don't belong to him won't be a part of his kingdom. They'll face a harsh judgment. And we remember about John that he didn't pull any punches. He was in your face, no matter who you were. And when people confessed their sins and decided they wanted to live their life for God and for his kingdom... John baptized them as a sign of repentance. Now, there's a couple of important and interesting facts here, okay? Uh, Here's one of them. Sadducees, who were religious leaders, and Pharisees came out to hear John. 
And when John saw them coming, what did he do? He kind of went off on them, didn't he? I mean, he called them snakes. You like to be called a snake. He meant sneaky and dangerous. And he warned them that just like everybody else, they needed to repent and live a whole new life. I like the way he said it, proved by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. See, that's the thing about repentance. If you're going to say you've done it, it's got to show up in the way you live. I mean, it's not enough to just talk the talk. You've got to walk the walk. And what's shocking about this is that Pharisees and Sadducees, well, they claimed to already be good examples, good models of how people should live for God, right? They were religious leaders. You know, the Pharisees, with all of their attention to the law, every minute detail, got their own core of scholars called scribes to follow them around and advise them on how they follow the law in every situation. Then you got the Sadducees. They're all about the temple. They're all about the rituals. They're all about, you know, you got to perform this ritual at this time, and you got to do it exactly this way. And listen, these guys didn't even like each other. They did not get along. They were sort of like, in our time, Democrats and Republicans, except with a religious twist, okay? They shared power on the Sanhedrin. They had to deal with each other. But they had such a different outlook. But both of them, both groups, put themselves forward as good examples for others of what it means to live for God. And here John the Baptist is talking to him, and he's saying, you got to repent just like everybody else because the way you're living is not what God's looking for. See, it's people's hearts that God wants. When He gets our hearts, He's got our lives. Baptism is important because it screams we've left the old life behind and taken up a new one. We now belong to God and intend to live for Him. Now, here's the most interesting thing. I said there's a couple interesting facts. Here's the most interesting one in this situation we read about with John the Baptist, okay? Jesus came to him and got baptized. Why? Jesus certainly didn't need to repent. I mean, he had no sin in his life, right? So why did he need to get baptized? And, you know, John, he resisted. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You should be baptizing me, not me baptizing you, but Jesus insisted. Why did he do that? Did you know he did that because of us? Because he wanted to completely identify with us as sinners. In other words, Jesus wanted to line up with us as sinners so that when it came time for him to die, he could rescue us as one of us. Now, I just want to make one more point about this, and we'll move on. John's baptism was not everything Christian baptism became. We will see that. After the death and resurrection of Jesus, baptism took on other meanings, okay? But John's baptism, this important recognition of a life of repentance, that formed the foundation for Christian baptism. Here's the next one. Baptism unites us in Christ's death. In the letter to the Romans, the Apostle Paul wanted to make sure there was no misunderstanding about grace, okay? Some people were trying to twist the meaning of grace. They said things like, hey, if grace is such a good thing, then let's just sin a whole bunch more so we can get more grace. If we're a mathematical formula, it'd read like this. More sin equals more grace. More grace, that's a good thing. And other people just thought, well, you know, if we're forgiven in Christ by grace, then it really doesn't matter if we keep on sinning. We can sin all we want to. If you were a thief before you came to Christ, keep on stealing. You're covered by grace. If you were an adulterer before you came to Christ, keep on having affairs. You're covered by grace. It'd be sort of like continually overdrafting your bank account, and the bank just pays all your bills, and they never charge you anything, and it doesn't bother them at all. 
Boy, don't we wish we could find that kind of a bank. You guys just pay all the bills. No. No, that's not what grace is about. Paul said grace comes through Christ's death, and he said our baptism wraps us up our old, sin-controlled, dominated nature in death. So a person who truly understands grace would never say, I don't care about honoring God. I'm going to do whatever I want. Or as one of my seminary professors used to say, grace, properly understood, is not opposed to effort. It recognizes there's effort in following Christ, in honoring God. Grace is opposed to earning. It says you cannot earn your righteousness through your efforts, but it's not opposed to effort. Here's how the Apostle Paul put it. Have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in his baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with him in baptism. Did you get that? See, baptism plunges us into the death of Christ. It identifies us with the death of Christ. It makes us a participant in the death of Christ. Baptism is all about us identifying with the death of Christ. Now, for him, it was the end of his physical life. For us, it marks the end of our sin-controlled, sin-dominated human nature that we were born with. It doesn't go away, but the power is broken, so we don't have to live as slaves to it anymore. Because of Christ's death and our participation in it through faith, Paul is saying a genuine character change takes place. In baptism, we live that out. We enact it. And Paul says there's a real change that takes place when we welcome Christ into our lives and commit ourselves to follow Him. Baptism says, my sin nature died. My heart has changed. I died to sin. I don't have to live in its control any longer doesn't mean we will never commit any sin, but it does mean the power of sin to captivate and to control and to make us slaves has been broken. We have freedom in Christ. We've died to that sin-dominated, sin-controlled nature with Jesus on the cross, okay? Our old nature's selfish cravings, ruinous addictions, Crafty deviousness died, ended, got crucified with Jesus, and baptism wraps us up with Christ. So it's real in our lives. It makes a difference. And then Paul goes on to say that just as Christ was raised out of death to a new life, so we come out of the water of baptism to live a whole new kind of life. God's character dominates our character so that we become a new person who wants to do what honors God every bit as much as we ever wanted to sin. Here's the last one. Baptism displays the unity of the church. Now, you might have lost track of this one somewhere along the way. One of the Apostle Paul's statements with regard to baptism, was a reminder to people about the unity of the church. And what he did was pointed out that everyone who enters the church enters through baptism. Rich or poor, Gentile or Jew, man or woman. So have you ever wondered, you know, why do churches always require that you've been baptized and many churches like the covenant? You don't have to be baptized here, but we want to know, have you ever been baptized? Because it's important as a follower of Christ. One more thing baptism represents is that kind of official entry into the church. This is not really a timing thing, you know, it's not like saying you can't go to church or 
listen to sermons or whatever until you've been baptized. No, it's just saying that when you are baptized, that marks your official entry into the church. And from that point forward, you are part of the church in the fullest sense. And he says everybody underwent the same kind of baptism. His point there, and I'm going to get to the verses in just a minute, is it's not like the rich get baptized in wine and the poor get baptized in water. No, we all got baptized the same way. We all got baptized with water. This is in 1 Corinthians. We know that there were a lot of divisions in the church at Corinth, right? Remember this? Some people were bragging about their spiritual gifts being more important than the gifts of other people. There was a lot of very destructive boasting going on, a lot of, you know, real fleshly kind of pride to remind them that in Christ we are all one. Paul called attention to the meaning of their baptism. Listen to 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13. This is what he said. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some of us are Gentiles, some of us are slaves, some of us are free. But we have all been baptized into the one body by the Spirit, and we all share the same Spirit. In other words, baptism reminds us that we're all on level ground in the church. And if you've read the book of Acts, you know that in Scripture, baptism was always closely connected with somebody's entry into the church, okay? Uh, when somebody left an old life behind and followed Christ, one of the first things that happened was they got baptized quickly. Just a couple of stories. Remember the Philippian jailer, you know, and his whole household were baptized right after Paul and Silas, it says, shared the word of God with them. Remember the story, you know, they were, Paul and Silas were in prison and then there was this earthquake and it, you know, shook the doors, it shook the bars loose. And the Philippian jailer is just about to commit suicide because if he loses his prisoners, you know, that's what's going to happen to him anyway. He's going to be put to death. And Paul and Silas holler out, don't arm yourself, we're still here. Well, that opened his heart to what they had to say. So they shared Christ with him. And it says that night, he and his whole household were baptized. You'll read that again and again in the book of Acts. And even Paul, you know, I talked about the Damascus Road experience. Hey, guess what? A couple days after that happened, he got baptized. So there was always this sense that, you know, this is kind of the starting point. This is the entry point into the life of the church. Baptism makes us fully a part of the church in a way we're not without it. In baptism, we surrender the idea that anyone is better or more important than anyone else. In baptism, we insist on every person's equality before God. And I just want to say uh, that the idea of human equality did not start with the Declaration of Independence. It really started in the pages of the New Testament. It was what the church modeled and taught and it was clearly seen and clearly stated in baptism. Making disciples means encouraging and supporting others not only to be baptized, that's important, but to live up to everything baptism is about, a repentant life, dying to the sinful nature with Christ and a commitment to unity in the church. Amen? Let's pray together. God, we may never fully understand all the mysteries of baptism. And we would never want to treat it as magic because that's never the way it's presented to us in the Scripture. But like the Lord's Supper, which we don't fully understand, but there is a genuine meeting and experience of Christ... We know this water is important 
to you. We know we need to be cleansed. We know we need to be on the path of a new life of following and honoring you in everything we do. And God, show us what that new life and that new path is about and renew us in our commitment to the unity of the church, your church. We thank you and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.